So today I'm going to discuss the, the legacy of the Howard government's use of um, ministerial staff. And I'm going to argue this legacy needs to be understood on several levels. But first we have to recognise that the decisions which have had the greatest legacy for Australia's ministerial staff system were made by the Hawke Labor government in 1984. So we just need to go back a bit in time. It was the Whitlam government that first brought large numbers of people from outside the public service into ministers' offices, and that was continued to some extent by the Fraser government. But the structures we have today were created in 1984 with the passing of special legislation to govern the employment of ministerial staff, and that's the Members of Parliament Staff Act, 1984. So it was in 1984 that the crucial decisions were made, which established ministerial advisers as a separate category of staff who were, who were by definition political and who were employed personally by ministers outside the public service. To trace the arc of development of the ministerial staff system, we really need to understand these foundational decisions of the early 1980s and their consequences. There was bipartisan support to expand the ministerial staff system at this time. In 1983, the Liberal Party had an internal review of the Fraser years, known as the Valder Report. And it argued we needed to substantially increase the political support staff for ministers, if ministers were to control have control over the apparatus of government. Labor's plan was to place politically appointed staff inside the public service, but this was fiercely resisted by the leading public servants of the day, in particular Sir Geoffrey Yeand, the head of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. While Sir Geoffrey supported many of the public service reforms Labor was making at the time, he was implacably opposed to the idea of placing political staff inside the public service. His briefs to the Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, which I've read, sizzle with concern and indignation. He described the plan as exceedingly damaging and infuriating. He said this would destroy the Westminster Public Service Australia had inherited, which was based on an impartial public service. In the end, Labor compromised and didn't place political staff inside the public service. Instead, it created a separate structure for political staff outside the public service, and departments remained neutral and impartial. Now, this separation of the political staff from the impartial public service is the fundamental structural characteristic of Australia's ministerial staff system, and it has a number of consequences. One consequence is that there were no constraints on its growth. And over the next 10 years, the politicised ministerial office flourished. In the Hawke and Keating periods, the number of political staff grew and their, their role grew substantially. And this is the context in which the Howard government came to power. So when the coalition formed government in 1996, they didn't undo the structures Labor had created. John Howard was initially critical of the number of ministerial staff and he reduced them by around 20%. But over time, their numbers eventually swelled well beyond what they had been under Labor. In fact, the number of ministerial staff at the end of the Howard period in 2007 is the highest we've ever seen. It was around 450 staff, and subsequent governments have never again reached these levels. Though, the last couple of years, numbers are increasing again, and I wouldn't be surprised if shortly we do reach that number again. The most dramatic growth uh, in the Howard years, though, was in the size of the Prime Minister's office, and that grew from 30 staff under Paul Keating to 50 under John Howard. So the Howard government inherited the, the ministerial staff system from Labor, and it went on to entrench it and to elaborate it, especially by reorganising the Prime Minister's office to be more focused on political management and executive coordination. In their book about the Prime Minister's Chiefs of Staff, Anne Tiernan and Rod Rhodes described the way that John Howard staffed his office as the triumph of the political. They quote David Kemp, who compared the Prime Minister's office under Malcolm Fraser with that under John Howard. David Kemp said, Howard exemplified the movement into centre stage of the political considerations of the government. And that was a significant change to the whole system. So, there was an increased dominance of political actors and political considerations in government. In 
and this is part of the Howard government's legacy for the ministerial staff system today. The Prime Minister's office under Paul Keating was very powerful. It had a strong coordinating role and a strong advising role, but its authority was largely informal. And this had led to some rare but damaging mistakes. When the Howard government came to power, it introduced some important innovations to the Prime Minister's office, the structure of the Prime Minister's office. And this strengthened its ability to exert political control and manage its tasks. John Howard broke with tradition and installed a political staffer as cabinet secretary. And this was initially Michael Lestrange. This role had traditionally been played by the head of Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Thus, a political actor was now put in charge of managing the operation of cabinet and its documents and its meetings. The wording of cabinet decisions, which is always important and contentious and has consequences, that wording was now put in the hands of a political operator and not a senior public servant. Working under the cabinet secretary was a new unit known as the cabinet policy unit, which was small, but it proved to be effective. So the cabinet secretary and the cabinet policy unit formed part of a sophisticated infrastructure of support for the prime minister and the government. They enabled political management of the cabinet process and more strategic thinking. This is because they had a role for keeping an eye to long-term agendas, which are so often obscured when governments are responding to short-term crises. They worked with ministers and ministers' offices on the tricky matters of what can be brought to cabinet, how and when. And this freed up the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff to focus on day-to-day -day issues, providing personal advice and, importantly, managing the Prime Minister's relationships. The Cabinet Secretary also worked closely with the head of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and with a new unit created in 2003 called the Cabinet Implementation Unit. And this was a departmental unit whose job was to monitor how decisions of Cabinet were being implemented. They produced reports, giving ministers and departments a traffic light rating, so green, amber or red, depending on their progress on implementation. And this kind of centralised tracking made ministers nervous at times, but it also increased discipline across the government. It was an early warning system, alerting the Prime Minister and the government to potential problems. The Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Peter Shergold, also provided the Prime Minister with a confidential document every week called Horizons. This two to three page document made him aware of upcoming matters at the bureaucratic level that he needed to be alert to. So all these mechanisms formed an interlocking system of political and bureaucratic coordination at the centre of government. Of course, how well these mechanisms worked in practice varied, depending on the individuals involved. But these structural innovations made it possible to achieve centralised political control across the ministry and across the bureaucracy. It was also helped by the unusual stability of the senior staff around John Howard, and of course, the stability of the prime ministership with just one incumbent for uh, over 11 years. And this really contrasts with the volatility we've seen in subsequent governments with both prime ministers and their staff churning rapidly. The Rudd and Gillard governments uh, dispensed with the cabinet policy unit and they sent that back into, into Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And they gave the Cabinet Secretary role to a minister. But when the coalition returned to power in 2013, it replicated the structure developed under John Howard of the Cabinet Policy Unit, which is now called Cabinet Office. And with one exception, the Cabinet Secretary was again a political staffer. In the current coalition government, the role of Cabinet Secretary has grown even further. They now wield much of the Prime Minister's authority in decisions around the Cabinet process. So this includes giving Ministers approval to bring items to Cabinet, finalising the agenda, and approving who can attend meetings and when Ministers can be absent. So in this way, the Howard Government provided a model for coalition Prime Ministers who followed in ways to structure and organise the Prime Minister's office.
There's also a more direct way we can see the legacy of the Howard government staffing for subsequent coalition governments. Australia has one of the biggest ministerial staffs in the world and staff turnover is high. And this means the Howard government employed many people as political staff over its long life. Some of them today are significant players in the Morrison government. 10 of the current ministers and assistant ministers, that's one quarter, worked as political staff in the Howard period. Greg Hunt, Alan Tudge, Josh Frydenberg, Matthias Corman, Paul Fletcher, Dan Tien, and Linda Reynolds are ministers who bring their experience as advisors in the Howard period to their work in today's cabinet. Since 2013, four of the five cabinet secretaries have previously worked as political advisors in the Howard government. Scott Morrison's current chief of staff worked as a political staffer to Tim Fisher, Mark Vail, and John Howard, including in the Cabinet Policy Unit. In this way, we can see the continuing influence of the Howard government through its former staff. One of the major weaknesses in our system of ministerial staff is that they're temporary, they churn quickly, and as a result, they often bring little, uh, bring to the job, little in the way of experience, institutional memory, understanding of the public service or the operation of government. <coughs> Advisors are sometimes denigrated as the Boy Scouts in the office, the kindergarten, they're wet behind the ears. Last year, the head of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Martin Parkinson, lamented the fact that ministerial staff, I quote, have no training on their personal roles and responsibilities or the separation between the apolitical public service and their own political roles. He said it can be hard for staffers to know how to work properly and effectively with the public service to implement their agenda. While this is true, there are some staff who provide a counterweight to the Boy Scouts in the office. I've researched the group of political staff who were recruited in the first Abbott government in 2013, when the coalition came to power after seven years in opposition. And my research shows that 27% of the advisors, the advisory staff recruited at this time, had previously worked as political advisors in the Howard government. Many returned to work as ministerial staff again after working in other areas. And almost 70% of chiefs of staff in 2014 were formerly political advisors in the Howard government. Many of them didn't stay very long because most staff don't but they formed an important cadre of seasoned political operators in that first period of coalition rule. We think of the public service as providing the crucial continuity in our political system. Richard Nixon famously called politicians the dust on the tabletop. Every few years the dust is wiped away, but the table remains. But it appears we might be starting to see some continuity of political personnel emerging in our system because of these large staff structures that we have. A small political cadre can have experience spanning different governments and different time periods, and they can bring knowledge gained from advising one government to the service of future governments. And I think that's a good thing because they can provide a bedrock of experience in a workforce that's so often young and rapidly churning. Alongside these positive developments are more contentious aspects of the Howard government's legacy when it comes to ministerial staff. During this period, there was an intense focus on the role and accountability of ministerial staff. At one level, it was sparked by the Children Overboard Affair of 2001. The Senate Select Committee, which inquired into that incident, noted a worrying role played by some ministerial staff in the events. And it was at this time that some commentators began referring to political staff as the junkyard attack dogs and the hard men and the hit men of the political system. Amplifying these concerns, the Howard government didn't allow its staff to appear before the Senate committee. But this wasn't the only catalyst for the questioning that began at this time. Pushing to the surface were deep anxieties and tensions about how the role of staff had developed and grown since 1984, with no regulation and scant attention to its broader impacts, which were now starting to be felt. At this time, calls came from many quarters to reconsider the roles, structures and practices that had evolved, and to reflect on how to establish them on a firmer footing going forward. <coughs> 
Unfortunately, the Howard government didn't step into that conversation. And that's surprising, as it had taken such a strong stance on accountability in its first term, as some people in this room are well aware. In 2003, a new Senate committee was established specifically to examine the role and functions of ministerial staff, how they could be held accountable, and the adequacy of their employment framework. And it was simply called the Inquiry into Staff Employed Under the Members of Parliament Staff Act. Its report was released at the end of 2003. Among other things, the committee recommended a code of conduct be developed for ministerial staff, which would clarify their role and its boundaries, and it should state that they couldn't direct public servants and they couldn't make executive decisions. The committee recommended there be an annual report on ministerial staff for greatest transparency and also to bring them into line with information provided on the public service. And it also recommended that ministerial staff be allowed to appear before parliamentary committees in certain very limited circumstances. The government senators on that committee rejected all of those recommendations. They argued it was unnecessary to have a code of conduct and that any regulation of staff could undermine the role of ministers and the confidential processes of government. And the Howard government never responded to the committee's report. I think this represented a lost opportunity to have a mature and open bipartisan debate about the appropriate boundaries and responsibilities of the advisor role and also about the protections that should be placed around that role. If we compare ourselves to the UK, there have been a series of parliamentary and other inquiries there exploring the role of special advisers in their system with all political parties participating. When Labor came to government in 2007, it introduced a code of conduct for ministerial staff and an annual report on their arrangements, and it stated that it would allow its staff to appear before committees in some limited circumstances, and that policy has not yet been tested. When the coalition government returned to power in 2013, it maintained that code of conduct under a different name, and it added new standards. It abolished the annual report. I believe this issue needs more bipartisan discussion. Developing good systems of regulation will not be simple to do. In fact, it will be very complex, but it remains unfinished business in our political system. In its third term, the Howard government also took a step away from transparency. The names of ministerial staff were published in the Commonwealth government directories alongside the names of senior public servants until 2001. In the 2002 directory, ministerial staff names were removed and they've never been in the public domain since. In most other countries, their names are published. So this was a turning point. I don't know why they were removed in 2002 and at what level that decision was made. If anyone can provide an answer to those questions, I'd appreciate your help. I'd like to better understand this aspect of the Howard government's legacy. I think ministerial staff play a vital role in supporting ministers to be effective in their jobs. And we should recognise this legitimate and important role by allowing the most senior staff to come out of the shadows and have their names published again alongside those of senior public servants in the government directory. Finally, if we're considering legacies, it's important to reflect on the impact of ministerial staff on the public service. This goes to the relationship between ministers, ministers' offices and departments. I interview ministers from time to time and it's interesting to me how often, unprompted, they raise the issue of the physical separation between ministers and their federal departments here in Canberra and how often they say it's a problem. In Australia, we have a double separation of ministers from their departments. At one level, it is physical. So ministers sit high on Capitol Hill with their offices away from the departments they work with. But on a second level, it's an institutional separation. In many countries around the world, ministers' offices are institutionally part of the civil service. So political staff and civil servants inhabit the one institution, even though they have different roles. <coughs> Now there are advantages to the separation we created, mainly because it protects the public service from the incursion of political actors 
and from politicisation. However, it also creates vulnerabilities and challenges. You will remember Sir Geoffrey Yeand, the head of Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet in 1983, and he stridently opposed Labor's plan of placing political staff inside departments. But he also opposed the idea of creating a separate institution for political staff under the Members of Parliament Staff Act, and he called this forming a separate political service. In his briefs, he predicted this would divide ministers from their departments, it could cause departments to become more remote, and it would reduce ministers' attachments to their departments. In his brief to Prime Minister Bob Hawke, he warned this could threaten the entire political administrative system. He said, it is the minister's relationship with his or her department that is quite fundamental to our system of administration and our system of government. As ministers rely more and more on their political staff for advice, and as the locus of policy making shifts increasingly to ministers' offices, departments face challenges. They must work with political staff across institutional boundaries, and these staff are intermediaries in their relationship with their ministers, and they have the power to block advice from reaching the minister. If departments can't work effectively with ministerial officers, they risk disconnection from ministers and from policymaking. Some recent surveys of public servants reveal a sense of malaise and uncertainty about the role of the public service and some fears that its role may be being displaced by political staff. Now, public service advice is rightly subject to contestability. But as Australia's ministerial staff continues to evolve, we need to ensure that policy advice from the public service can gain purchase in ministers' offices, that it's not ignored amidst the urgency of short-term political objectives, and relationships between ministers' offices and departments need to be close partnerships. Partnerships in which the professional, apolitical expertise of the public service is respected. In other words, we need to make sure that what Sir Geoffrey Yeand feared doesn't come to pass. The 11 years of the Howard government was an important period in the development of the ministerial staff system, and it has left a legacy. But it's only one stage in a long trajectory of growth and increasing predominance. And the consequences of this trajectory are something we need to pay attention to and we need to discuss.